I got stuck in another hotel about two years ago in the gas land instead of where I wanted to be over on the, the side, which had no parking. And so it was $75 a day for parking. Oh my Lord. And there was no, it was valet or nothing. That was, that was so, crazy. So I drove to the airport, which is like a mile away, parked at an airport place, took an Uber back and the airport place was like $11 a day. <laughs> It was like, I, I felt like I had like, I gained the system. Like, ha ha, I win. I don't know. And then you came and, back and found your car was egged. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad. <laughs> it's after five. So just for the people that are here who might not know who you are, I'm sure they all do, but can you just tell people who you are, what you do? My name is Steve Sansweet, and uh, I am head of Rancho Obi-Wan, which is a museum in Northern California, Petaluma, California, that houses the Guinness World Record largest collection of Star Wars memorabilia. And um, I come to it by being a Star Wars fan all my life, having seen the first movie a week and a half before it opened at the back lot of 20th Century Fox when it was uh, screened for journalists. I was working at the time for the Wall Street Journal. And uh, after 26 years at the Wall Street Journal, nine of them bureau chief in Los Angeles, I left to join Lucasfilm, where I was head of fan relations and director of content management for 15 years. Uh, Rancho Obi-Wan has been established as a nonprofit museum since 2011. We do uh, weekly tours when things are nice, and free of <laughs> pandemic and all that stuff and uh, now we have uh, we have memberships and uh, you can go to ranchoobiwan.org you can become a member and support us uh, or join our new virtual museum at different subscription levels and see lots of video and pictures of the collection and what we've been doing at Rancho for all these years. Wow so when I when I first met you first day I met you was when uh, I went to your house for the book signing for the Chronicle book and Harry Frydenberg, that's after I bought his, you know, all of his inventory. And right. he said, you gotta you go over to, you know, he's like, you gotta go over to Steve's house. I'm like, who's Steve? And so that, that's the time when you were the West Coast Bureau Chief of the Wall Street Journal. So, and I remember- 1992. That, yeah. Now that transition for you was, that was a big deal because you know, I'm sure, not sure if people know, I mean, being the West Coast Bureau Chief of the Wall Street Journal, that's a big job, right? That's just like, there's like the editor, you know, in New York, and then there's you, right? We were the, yeah, we were the largest uh, non-Washington, non-New York bureau at the time. We had a uh, maximum of 17 reporters in there. It was so uh, pretty big. That, I mean, to, and then you went to go work at Lucasfilm. So I, I can only assume that was a, a huge pay cut. <laughs> well, let's say that uh, <laughs> Lucasfilm sort of learned from Disney and Disney had the uh, sort of history as being the worst uh, paying uh, studio in Hollywood. Uh -huh. And uh, people wanted to work for Lucasfilm. So right. uh, I took a bit of a shave. <laughs> but uh, never, never regretted it. Never <laughs> regretted it. I love, I love working at the Journal, and I love working at Lucasfilm. That's and, wonderful. And my staff knew how much of a Star Wars fan that I was, and so when I said that I was going to, it wasn't like I was leaving for the New York Times or the Washington Post. So they yeah. were, they were very happy for me. Nice. So, what year did the the Tomart Guide come out? The Tomark Guide was 1994 or 95, the first one. 94 or um, 95. So I was 22. I was born in 73. So as I was 21 oh, or 22. Oh, rub it in, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't know if you know this, but um, uh, and, and I had been selling Star Wars stuff to you for a while, but not yeah. a lot. I wasn't a major player at that point. But you put me in the acknowledgments of that book. And I don't know if you know this, but that, that had a huge impact on my business. Like, you know, I could show people that I was in the book. People would come to sell me collections. They didn't know me or whatever. It's like, look, I'm in the book. And that was like, that was like such, I don't know, you know, your reasoning or was an afterthought or whatever. But that was like, 
No, that it was, was like the thank a, you for your. It was the thank you for your uh, help. Of course, if I knew this, what you're telling me now, I could have charged you for this. <laughs> I mean, that was that was like a a critical like turning point for me, um, and it kind of like helped put me on the map. And you're really one of the people along the way that really kind of gave me that push. Um, it's a. Uh, but you also did something else for me as a collector because when you had the house in, in Silver Lake, was it Silver Lake, Las Feliz? Yeah, Las Feliz. Las Feliz. Um, Los Feliz. Sorry, <laughs> excuse me. Um, going over to your house um, cured me of, uh, of wanting to own, you know, one of everything because I could go there and I could see all the posters on the wall and I could see, you know, the candy bars from Hungary and I could see the, you know, the ceramics from wherever, like it was just all there. And then I, I would look at it and say like, do I need this in my life? Or like, no, I can just go to Steve's. It's like, cool. And that like, you saved me a, a lifetime of collecting that. I just ended up collecting different stuff. I, I don't know. Well, I, I, a lot of people have told me that, that I, <laughs> people, people who have worked for me and had collections say, well, there's no need for me to collect. I'm, I'm going to sell all my stuff because you have it all and I can see it here. Right. I mean, I remember Josh was in the same boat, like he was working there every day and then he'd like, he's like, I'm done. <laughs> I don't need to. <laughs> and what's funny is like Ian here, who's sitting over here at the computer who works for me, he's kind of the same way. He's like, I want this thing, but I sit here and I work with it every day. I don't need to own it. He gets to just yeah. experience it. And uh, so you, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we so, figure we have about 400,000 items in the collection these days. So not only well, do we have Rancho Obi-Wan, which is about 9,000 square feet, but we've got two offsite uh, warehouses that mm -hmm. uh, are about another 6,000 square feet to total. So uh, lots of stuff. And that's enabling us, at least it was before all this crap happened, mm -hmm. it, it enables us to uh, inventory the collection and get like items together and know exactly what we have and uh, uh, eventually uh, add on to the database that we have. So every time I send you a box of stuff with all this like detritus and like ephemera and stuff, like all that stuff, like it's cataloged and, or is that just still sitting in a box like that? You'll get to it in like 2032. 2032 is probably <laughs> a pretty good estimate. <laughs> I'll be on advanced Medicare at the time and uh, walking with bionic legs, no doubt. But, uh, uh so tell me about the decision to to go to a nonprofit and create the, um, you know, to create that that organization from just being a, a private collector. So oh, now we, now your, now your job is like running a nonprofit. Like right. how is that? It's it's a lot different. We we moved up here in uh, 1998, mm -hmm. and so uh, I was looking for a place that had space and. Um, this was a this was a house that had two large or three really large chicken barns. Up until the early 1970s, there were about 20,000 hens in these chicken barns, um, and so we had a lot of work to do. I took the first chicken barn and we remodeled it, uh, and it became my warehouse. And so I had stuff out on shelves so I could see it and interact with it. And other people could see it. Um, and of course people wanted to come over and take a look. And so I would have friends and members of the 501st from all over. And, um, eventually as I was working at Lucasfilm and it became clear it was getting close to retirement from Lucasfilm, um, we decided to do something different and turn this into a museum that would be accessible to the public and that the way to do that was to turn it into a 501c3 nonprofit organization so we could actually charge money but there would be tax breaks and you know just like any nonprofit um, and it's worked out really well of course it took uh, poor Ann Newman who's uh, the collection manager about 150 hours to fill out the nonprofit paperwork. 
Right, I can imagine. Uh, literally, yeah. 150 hours. They, they, there's a Paperwork Reduction Act that says that in all government forms, they have to put about how long it will take you to fill out the forms. And on the back of these forms, it said something like 120 hours, and that wasn't nearly <laughs> enough. I mean, that's pretty frightening when you get something and it says, it will take you 120 hours to fill this out. Wow. And so there's, I, well, I'm, I think what's great about this is I'm assuming that like now that it's in the hands of a nonprofit, like after you're gone, like this is not going to all be broken up and sold and go out. To, it'll still remain a collection that people can visit for eternity. Is that, is that the... Where am I going? <laughs> <laughs> Nowhere, Steve. We're not going anywhere. We're yeah, that's going to live forever. That 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 is that is the general idea and uh it, it it is something that uh that we hope to have around for a long long time and uh and, and that's another reason i'm doing the videos and has always wanted me to write a, a an autobiography which nobody would read so it's much better i'm sitting down and doing you know every month i'm doing a an about steve video but we're also doing a lot of stuff on the collection and all the stories. I mean, that's what it's always been about. That's what the tour is about. Not only looking at the stuff, but hearing the stories behind it and why something was made or how silly something is or why that came about and how I got it and things of that nature. And so all of the docents who do tours now have been through my tours a number of times. And um, so they know my stories and sometimes they'll embellish on the stories in very entertaining ways and i said i didn't know that <laughs> that's funny so for the rec fun. for the just for the record everybody i'm 46 and steve still refers to me as hey kid <laughs> just, just just saying all well, right so it's true uh let's talk about bootleg toys not the stuff that we sell but like real you know foreign knockoffs and, and bootlegs did you always have a, an affinity for that? Like when in the 70s and 80s, as that stuff came out, were you attracted to that stuff? Or did the, is that something you found later? No, uh, with the bootleg stuff, as opposed to the art toys and the uh, and the We're kind talking of about real, real bootlegs. Right, I'm talking about, yeah, the bootleg stuff. That was just about the only stuff you could get in the beginning. All the laser swords and the light swords and uh, all that kind of stuff was, uh, was uh, uh, available, people could get that out a lot quicker than Kenner could get out its uh, plastic action figures. It wasn't until uh, February, March of 1978 that they started selling the carded figures and the, the plastic vehicles and things like that came a little later. So those things were out. I was attracted to them because they were part of the phenomenon. I mean, Star Wars was, an amazing phenomenon. It just swept the country and then as it rolled out around the world, it swept the world. It took almost a year or a little more than a year for Star Wars to play all over the world. Japan was one of the last countries and that wasn't until June of 1978. Well, and of course, Star Wars opened in the US in May of 77. But uh, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of stuff that was, uh, that was out there. And then as things progressed, there would be some of the weird figures and uh, galaxy heroes and um, companies put out, U.S. companies, U.S. toy companies put out space toys. And um, they weren't knockoffs of Star Wars. They couldn't sue them, but they were, they were picking up on the whole outer space phenomenon. Just like there were cheapo movies that were put out quickly in the next couple of years. And um, Star Wars was responsible for a lot of people making a lot of money and a lot of people spending a lot of money. So did you, but were you actively buying that stuff? Were you buying yes. the space swords and all that? You, 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 you saw that that had value. Well, I, I, was, I was attracted by it or to it. Um, I, I just, I did, never bought the stuff because I thought it was going to be worth something in the future. I mean, if I had known that, I would have bought 10 of each uh, or 100 of each carded vintage right. action figure. Sure. It's, it's always that way. But I had a friend, I did a, um, a space toy uh, photo guidebook for Starlog magazine. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And the action Star Lock, the the Star Wars action figures had been out. We did one spread on Star Wars in this book, but um, there were a lot of pictures of older space toys. Bob Burns's amazing collection of space toys, and I thought, man, if I had a time machine, go back to the stores back in the mid '50s and buy this Robbie the Robot moon car, which, you know, back then was selling for $500, which mm -hmm. today would go for $10,000. Um, that would be great. And then I thought, well, for Star Wars, I'm sort of in the time machine. And it, it, it is the time that things are new on the shelves. And I was an adult. I had a, uh, I had a disposable income. And so I was buying all the stuff uh, new on the shelves at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so when the, when the bootleg figure, the bootleg figure started coming out in the foreign countries, like the Turkish figures, Polish, all those other figures, um, were you actively getting those as they were coming out or is that something you I was, got to later? Uh, I was, when I saw, you know, Toy Shop was the, the bi-weekly classified advertising when there, when there used to be newspapers when there used mm -hmm. to be classified advertising in print. And you would get all these amazing ads from dealers all across the world. You know, sometimes I was too late to get all the, I never got a headman because they always sold out the headman before I got the publication. Right. Well, because um, you could pay FedEx, like you could have the toy shop next day aired to you, you if could. you decided to pay like $500 a year. every. I was too, every I was too cheap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I regret that now. <laughs> I, I regret that. So, um, but yes, I was buying that stuff when, when there was a find of the Lily Lady 12 inch figures. Uh -huh. uh, I was buying that stuff. Um, so yeah, I was, I was buying a lot of foreign stuff. Then I met a, my, my good buddy from Japan at the time, Aime Takeda, uh -huh. who now goes by Sword Takeda. And, uh, <laughs> of course. Of course. As as you would as as one does right as, as one does, <laughs> and um, we we started a pen pal relationship, and then we started trading things. I would trade him American toys for Japanese stuff, and then I would pay him to find more Japanese stuff. Mm -hmm. So my early Japanese collection is uh, is is pretty pretty darn good. I've got a lot of the stuff that um, that was put out in 1978, 79. Mm -hmm. I just remember you like with the fist in the air, like Aime, like because he had like ten years worth of toys for you. They would show up very yeah. slowly. <laughs> Is that still the case, or have you gotten it all? <laughs> um, no, it's we uh, we uh, let's see. Okay, let's see. We we've got something from Lydia here who said she watched a Rancho Obi Wan walkthrough recently and got excited when we stopped at the bootleg section. Can't wait to see it in person when all of this stuff is over. Yeah. So what was your first introduction to, um, to this world where artists, not so much customizers, the customizers were there, I think, from day one. The customizers but, were there from day one and Lucasfilm at some point in mm -hmm. the 90s was actually trying to shut down the customizers. So these were people who were doing one-offs basically, but... Uh, okay. And um, that view sort of changed. So um, I think people understand that playing in George Lucas's sandbox is very good for the franchise, not bad for the franchise. As long as somebody's not making a hundred thousand of something, the bootleggers and the bootleg toys from China and from other places around the world will still shut down if it comes in. Um, we, we call those pirated toys. They're pirated they're, meant, is, they're meant to yeah. meant to fool people. Right. 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 Um, so so what was your what was your first introduction to these handmade you know art figures? I'm trying to think back, and I think uh, a lot of the early stuff and my knowledge of this stuff came from Sucklord. Do you remember him walking around? Mike, the first time I met him was him walking around the convention in his getup, you know, with a boombox. I met him, I'm, I saw him the first time at Celebration One in Denver. And there was this guy with a, with a, no, it couldn't have been Denver. 
Uh, yeah, 1999. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it was Denver. That's right. Yeah. He had a he had um, he had the Boba Fett helmet and a jacket and uh-huh. the boombox, and he was doing the the Star Wars breakbeats, uh-huh. which, which almost got him into a world of trouble. Uh, but how did he avoid that trouble? Um, because... I think he toughed it out. I think they sent him a cease and desist on the breakbeats. No, if I'm not I mistaken, so. I don't no? think so. He, he said he handed a copy to Howard Rothman, and just like, here, I made this, you know, can we license this? And they're just like, no, we, we don't know what, what, we don't know what this is. We don't know what to do with this. You've sampled, you know, words from the movie. We'd have to pay the actors. They're like, we can't like, I mean. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the worst kind of thing to do is to play uh, three seconds or more of the Star Wars music anywhere online or something. And the DMI <laughs> will get you right away because the, uh, because the musicians union is so strong. Mm. So uh, that's still the case these days with TV or anything else you have to pay. And Lucasfilm can't avoid that royalty itself. So how do you, are, are you still a completist? Are you still trying to achieve, to achieve everything or have it, has it changed with the, having the nonprofit? Like, I define complete as different. I would like everything, uh-huh. but I can't. And my income has changed, my income level. I don't make a lot of money these days. I don't, I am not independently wealthy. People think I'm independently wealthy because I have so much Star Wars stuff. No, I just spent all my money for 40 years plus. Just, you know, it's just, I didn't eat for 39 years. I just, uh, no. it's, it's, it was my recreation. I don't take a lot of trips and, uh, um, I've been around the world thanks to Star Wars, going to conventions, but um, not a lot of vacations. Um, I like sticking close to home, and um, I've just spent a lot of my assets on Star Wars. Got it. Um, so another thing that I, I kind of credit you with, um, there, there's something I just didn't understand when I was younger, and you know, I would hear you, you know, I'd just be hanging out at your house with you know, Josh or Wade, and we'd just be, I don't know, whatever, playing pinball and just looking through stuff. And you would do a tour and you had a, a wooden adat on the top shelf. Yeah. Um, and you would talk about it as like a piece of folk art. Still one that, of my favorite pieces. I'm sure. Uh, and at, at that age, at, when I was my age, I just thought like, I just wanted like the Kenner toys. And it was that I had no appreciation for like, for what folk art was or that someone had handcrafted that, you know, the best that they knew how to make out of wood for themselves or for a kid or whatever the circumstance was. And what I find, especially in the figures that we, uh, that we sell and help get to market um, is that as everything has gotten so slick, my taste has gone in that direction. And, you know, some of my favorite figures that they are putting out like Mark Todd's toys, which are, as he calls very, you know, naive. Oh yeah. Innocent looking. Um, the Carlos Ramirez, uh, you know, these pieces that were made out of like the the vintage oh, beer cans. The cans, yeah. Yeah, no, they are. Yeah. They are very and, cool. And so what I find is like the stuff that I am most excited about, um, especially ceramics. Um, I've been doing all of the bootleg ceramic so for those of you who don't know there there would uh a lot of these companies would make these blank you know before the vader project you know that we did before people uh even in designer toys would make blanks of certain toys uh for people to customize uh these bootleg ceramic companies would make these uh i don't know what do you call them the white white whiteware yeah whiteware and they um and people would paint them. And uh, so when I find them on eBay, like the way that they're listed, it says, you know, R2-D2 statue. And it says, buy Mike. You know, and they're, <laughs> ask, they're asking like $200 for it. And then I have to explain to them that like Mike was a kid in art class, you know, in 1984. And this thing is not worth $200. And then, you know, the ones that I get for $20, $25 are, are kind of, kind of fun and I especially like when I get a collection in 
and in the collection is something someone has made, you know, out of ceramic. Janky, can you hand me that horrible R2-D2 right there? Yes. Oh, the uglier, the better. I mean, it, it's, it's magic. And you can tell it's not even whiteware. I think they, they made it themselves. Uh, uh, yeah, no, that would have started out as whiteware. That was whiteware too? And yeah, you know, it's, and it, it gets painted, then glazed, and then fired at the ceramic store. Uh, you're right, because look, there's a bank opening, and it's, yeah. they didn't do that themselves. Um, but look, it's signed by Quam from 2002. <laughs> that's a recent one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of them are from the 80s. When that, the that was a big thing. Every, every downtown had at least one ceramic shop, and you find mostly ladies going there and doing their, and sometimes they would do the painting there and then let the shop fire it, and then they come back and glaze it and then take it home. And there were lamp kits too that were done. The bootleg lamp kits that were right. wise I man. Yeah. You know. I, I just picked up a Princess Leia recently because I had, you know, the R2 and the, the Vader and then the Chewy were pretty prevalent, but the, the Leia with the, and they all had little holes where you would put the right. little like jewels. Can you hand me that wicket that's right up there? And the, so I, I didn't actually realize it because that one, yeah, I thought wicket had bullet holes. And then someone, <laughs> someone, and I thought like, oh, this is amazing. He's got no eyes and bullet holes. And then, you know, someone explained to me, see all those like little holes that yep. that's where you'd put all like the little jewels and you'd make it into a lamp. This one being by M. Myers. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, M. Myers. Mike, Michael Myers. Michael Myers. Oh right. my goodness. But Talk never, about mixing pictures. He never put the pieces in the eyes and just Wicket looks creepy. Yeah. And so it's kind of fun when I end up with like two or three of the same, you know, whiteware pieces. Like uh, I have a couple of them that are blank. I like to try and find a blank one and then have two or three, you know, done in some horrible fashion. Um, so that, that has been, in my old age, that has been sort of fun as, <laughs> as the, you know. What are you talking about, know, kid? <laughs> the, 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 you know, as the licensed toys, you know, have very little meaning for me. Um, There's some stuff that's cool. Uh, the new Barbie dolls have a certain aesthetic that are really sort of cool. and got very charged on this, and we, we split an order of Barbie dolls. But how did that happen? Because that's Mattel, so... I know. Well, Mattel also does the Hot Wheels. It's the, they oh, have the Star, Star Wars, Wars Hot Wheels. They have the Star Wars license for Hot Wheels, and then they did the Barbie. And the crossover, it's mm -hmm. high fashion. I mean, these are like $100, $100 plus dolls. Wow. But they are really... They are really pretty, pretty cool. The uh, C-3PO uh, is done on one of their black doll bases and just has the dress, the way it's designed and everything is just, uh, it's just really uh, an amazing crossover. Two cultural icons, Star Wars and Barbie, and it's, uh, yeah, it's that's what it's called, Star Wars X Barbie. Mm -hmm. Because for like 20 years, I thought Hasbro kind of had the master toy license and that they just did. prevented everyone from doing anything. And if Hasbro didn't want to do it or if it was competition, it was like you couldn't do it. And then somehow Lego kind of squeezed in there. And yep. then so did the, did the whole licensing change? Did Lucasfilm change all that? Yes. They, what? they, the, the, the Hasbro contract when it was renegotiated in the 90s. Mm -hmm. The story goes, and it may be apocryphal or mm -hmm. it may be partially true, the story goes that Hasbro had a worldwide license in perpetuity, or Kenner did. And then, of course, Hasbro bought Kenner in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And the Kenner contract said that they would keep the license forever as long as they made Star Wars toys that brought in at least a $10,000 royalty or they sent a check for $10,000 to Lucasfilm each year. Mm -hmm. And then the takeover, somebody forgot or didn't think because it was in the early 90s and there was no more Star Wars, they didn't think to send the check and the contract expired. Wah, wah. <laughs> so it was totally renegotiated and, and that allowed for a lot of other things to happen years later. And of course, then Disney takes over and they do contracts a lot differently. They do contracts for each region. 
-hmm. So there are very few worldwide contracts these days. Interesting. And so I know you said you're not, so are you not actively, I know that you said you're completist, but you don't have to have everything. So how do you decide now? Like, how well, I'm buying, I'm buying Lego. I'm buying uh -huh. the, the Hasbro stuff, the, uh, the action figures. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I've totally cut out, uh, just about, I, I buy samples of tops cars because they started coming out with eight sets a year mm -hmm. and, and the uh, boxes that cost a hundred bucks for four cards. And uh, <laughs> I just got a little fed up with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, Tops is no longer on the list. Um, comics. Are you, still do you still doing posters? Yes, I'm still doing posters, although it's harder for me to get the foreign posters, but I've got the posters, all the, uh, uh, the US theatrical posters for the uh, sequels. Mm -hmm. um, so I must have over 3,000 posters right now, and I'm still buying some art. Uh, when the Mondo posters came out, those were mm -hmm. incredible. I loved those. And uh, some of the new posters from some of my favorite artists, uh, you know, like uh, Jerry Vanderstel, Russ Walks, sure. Joe Caroni, if Mark Gratz does a piece. You know, there's certain people whose work I really love. I still buy original art and uh, get gifted with things. People give the museum some of the stuff. So um, it's a very nice, very nice situation to be in because when uh, someone gives something to the museum, it becomes the property of Rancho Obi-Wan, the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, the things that I buy with my own money are still my own items. And mm -hmm. I lend to the museum for use at mm -hmm. zero dollars a year. The same Got thing it. for the use of the facility. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I don't know, Steve. I don't know where it's all going. Well, it's been crazy. It's been a you know, just just when you think it's all going to die, then the Disney sale comes through, and then there are more there are more uh, movies, and then you know the movies get mixed reviews, and then the Mandalorian comes out, and everybody gets excited again. So um, Star Wars is going to be with us for a long, long time. Yeah, I I've I'm actually in a good place with it. You know. It, I think 20 years ago when the the prequels came out, I, I went to a very dark place and I've kind of come out the other side and uh, forgive me for people who are watching this, if you've already heard this story this weekend uh, or this week. Um, but, you know, if someone asks you like, are you a Batman fan, right? There's 75 years of Batman material, most of which is garbage, right? But everyone's got a movie, a TV show, a cartoon, a comic, a breakfast cereal, a video game some kind of content um, of Batman that they like. And if you say I'm a Batman fan, it doesn't mean that you like 75 years of content. Right. And so now I'm more comfortable saying that I'm a Star Wars fan. There are things that I really like that have changed my life that have been very influential. And there's things that, you know, are just not for me. And, and that's okay. And, like, um, and then the other conclusion I've come to is that all the new movies and even the prequels, I just look at those as fan fiction, right? The first three movies were, episode four, five, and six were kind of like canon. Those are real. And everything else is just someone's take on what they think Star Wars should be. And when I have that attitude, then I go to the theater, I watch the movie, I enjoy it. I don't start pulling it apart and digging too deep and saying this makes sense or this person ruined this or this, you know, it's like, because the way that they took all the stories before Disney took over, all the extra expanded universe, and they just threw it out, right? And it's like, well, if you can do that, then they can, I can throw out whatever I want. Absolutely. I just, Absolutely. I will, I will like what own, I like. It should be your own thing. And that's, that's what I feel about Star Wars too. People, people ask me questions and, you know, what's your favorite or what don't you like? I mean, I like it all. I don't love it all. Sure. Um, but I have my likes and, and um, you know, just like you. Um, and the same thing with the merchandise. I mean, there's some really, although if it's really a piece of crap, I like it because it's such a piece of crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, some of, some of the stuff can be uh, pretty, uh, pretty severe.
<laughs> All right, Steve. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm sure you My got pleasure, stuff to do. It's really been wonderful uh, catching up again. And uh, hopefully next year I'll see you in San Diego. That would be great. All you right. take, care. take care. Thank you so much. Zen and the love of Star Wars. Yes.